First Minute Capital is a $100 million seed fund, proudly backed by a number of tech founder LPs, including 30 unicorn founders. Part of First Minute's DNA as a fund is to take wisdom and lessons learned from one generation of successful entrepreneurs and share those lessons and pieces of advice with the next generation of successful founders. And that's really what this webinar series is all about. My First Minute is a fun opportunity to speak informally to some of the world's top leaders from business, sport, and politics on the first minutes of their careers, how they see the world, and general leadership advice. My name is Tommy Stadlin. I'm a LP and venture partner at First Minute Capital. And today I'm speaking to Jenny Fleiss, the co-founder of Rent the Runway. We have with us today Jenny Fleiss. Jenny, best known to most of you, I'm sure, is the co-founder of Rent the Runway, a billion dollar fashion rental company. Um, I think investors often like to talk about category defining companies and Rent the Runway is the ultimate category defining company. In fact, I think it is a category creating company. It pioneered online clothing rental and until very recently, it was the only major player in the space. So it completely dominates the space. Um, competitors have just somehow not been able to get close to it. It's interesting because it's a brand phenomenon which has grown to this enormous scale with almost no paid marketing until recently all through viral word of mouth and strength of the product and strength of the brand. But it's also a logistics phenomenon. Not many people know that it's the largest dry cleaner in the world. So it takes, I think, a special pair of people to build a company like that. Jenny founded Rent the Runway with her Harvard Business School classmate, Jen Hyman. Uh, Jenny then went on to co-found and run Jet Black, which was and is Walmart's members only concierge shopping service. So she's a serial entrepreneur. She's also a philanthropist, very successful angel investor, and very much a New Yorker. So Jenny, welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. So let's go back to the beginning for you. The show is My First Minute, and it's all about people starting out. Before Rent the Runway, and before even your college admissions business that you started before then, before HBS, if we went and met the 15-year-old Jenny in the 90s, what would we see? Would we see someone who we thought this person is definitely going to be an entrepreneur because of the way she's raised, her character, what she's, what she's up to as a, a kid, as a teenager? Where did that entrepreneurial spark come from? I think you would have already seen that. You know, the first time I remember it is an eight-year-old running lemonade stands and just really feeling that that was all I wanted to do with my time, right? Like every sunny summer day, more than tennis or any other sport and activity, like that's how I would chose to spend my time as much as my parents would let me. Um, and so I think between that and then loving to shadow my parents who were both entrepreneurs in their own work environments, uh, I was always kind of really intrigued by the world of entrepreneurship and creation, uh, always looking for, you know, a new way to store my books in my book bag or to solve little problems around, you know, can I make up pencil holder with duct tape. So whatever it was that the problem I was facing in a given day, I was always kind of oriented towards creatively thinking of ways to solve that um, and contribute to create something from nothing. Got it. You were also obviously very highly educated and, and went to, you know, all the top schools. You started your career in, in a corporate setting in with Morgan Stanley, I believe. Yeah. Was that always for you a stepping stone, a training ground to sharpen your skills so that when you became an entrepreneur, you'd be a better entrepreneur? Or did you think actually initially you thought you'd have a, a career in corporate America or finance America? Yeah, so as much as when I look back on it, I was always kind of this serial entrepreneur. Um, and, and actually one of my first jobs was an internship and I worked for at a juice bar for someone who had like started his own juice bar. And that of all the job experiences I have was one that like really was memorable, stuck with me and had so many learnings. I was really passionate about it. You know, I think we're so prone to following the course and path that's laid out in front of us. So growing up in New York, the world of finance was very much around me. Um, I went to a very competitive high school. So then it was about getting into a top school. I went to Yale where I ironically majored in political science because a lot of people who were smart were doing that. And then when I went to the career services department there, you know, the only real 
industries, recruiting, were finance and consulting. Um, and most people were staying in New York in terms of my friends and other kind of well-educated people at, at school with me. Um, and so I kind of, you know, I, I fell into it and then I assumed like if, if all the top other, you know, other top students were doing it and vying for these jobs, then I was going to go for the kind of most competitive, you know, top job. Um, and so it was kind of just following this like career ladder, if you will. And I think it wasn't until I, I really took a moment to step back um, and think about like, you know what, I'm not loving this. I'm not passionate about it. It feels very much like work. I don't feel that I'm ever going to be the top 5% performers because I just don't love it in that way. Um, and gave myself kind of permission to then go to business school to rethink careers and learn about different industries. Did I stumble upon the fact that being an entrepreneur could actually be a job, right? Like I didn't even realize or put it together in that way before. Very interesting. What about, before we go on to Rent the Runway, let's talk about the, the college admissions business, which was obviously a smaller, your, your first foray into it, apart from the lemonade stands. What, I'm curious what you learned from that experience and how that helped you when you went on to do it for real with Rent the Runway. Yeah, and it's funny because I, in some ways, aspects of that business, I think, would actually do very well right now. But um, what happened is I, you know, I had spent so much time on my own college application process, right? Um, applying to all these, you know, top schools, visiting them. Uh, and when I went and then worked in finance, I still had a lot of, you know, first my siblings, but a lot of their friends and stuff organically asking me for advice and help writing college essays, editing college essays, thinking about what schools to apply to. And so I started doing it ad hoc. And then when I got, you know, kind of third and fourth degrees of, of, of folks started, you know, charging for it myself. And it was a bit of like my side hustle while I was working in finance. And I did find that kind of entrepreneurial energy from it in a way that my day job or often night job in finance um, wasn't really giving me, right? So I kind of always had it as, as that side hustle. Um, and what I started to do in my real like kind of opinion that I started to form in doing this was that if you were able to pair up someone applying to school uh, and their top school choice with someone who'd went to that school as the tutor or advisor, you would have a much more organic fit and a great chance for, you know, the applicant to learn about the school authentically and to kind of orient their application to a way that was best likely to kind of get them into that school. So that's what I started then trying to do. Of like once kind of I hit my maximum, I'm like full-time job in finance and the couple of people I was advising, I started to pull in other peers of mine who had gone to top schools and to try to pair them with other people who were like, I want to go to Dartmouth, I want to go to Harvard and to try to get their applications kind of aligned there. So it was like a form of personalization in a way to just get people more into the right tutor. When I went to Harvard Business School, I started thinking about like what kind of technical platform could I leverage to accelerate and grow this business. And so I spent some time in kind of a field study program working a bit on that. Um, and ultimately, there was someone who uh, was an undergrad at the time and was a tutor and became really passionate. And I wound up kind of selling my equity stake, so to speak, um, when I kind of moved on to work on Rent the Runway. So you, you go to college, you go to, um, you go to Wall Street, build this first business, and then you end up at Harvard Business School um, with your eventual co-founder, yes. uh, other Jennifer, Jen Hyman. Um, and, you know, in some ways, this is the classic, um, it's a version of the American dream. You get a good corporate job, go off to business school, have a good idea, and it works out. Except in your case, it works out unbelievably well. I'm really curious to take you back to that experience with, 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 with Jen at HBS, were you natural co-founders? Is it always going to be the two of you coming up with this business together? Like, why were you guys such a good fit and, and how did it happen? Yeah. And well, thank you for your, your kind words around my success and my journey. I think it's, it's very easy for it to look like all kind of glitter and unicorns from the outside. And, you know, what I'm always reminding entrepreneurs, because I think there's such kind of a, a sexy, glamorized view of entrepreneurship these days is like, there's a lot more highs and lows and grit and hustle and uncertainty in that story. And so, you know, I think when Jen and I met, it was actually the first day of business school. And uh, ironically, she came up to me with my name written on a post-it note because her sister um, told her to look out for me. And we happened to be in the same section. So of a thousand people in your business school class, you know, you, you split up into about 10 different sections. And so we were in the same group of, of, you know, 90 to 100 people. We had the same name. And so obviously we kind of got to know each other fairly quickly. And for the first year, it was much more just as classmates and peers. And, and we were friendly as well. And we started to see how we each interacted around the case study method, which is you dig into 
a business or a business topic and you kind of deep dive on an aspect of it. And the class is expected to kind of teach, teach the class essentially through the students. So the, the teacher is facilitating, but you really get a chance to hear how different peers think about a business problem. And so it was this unique chance to say, I really respect this person. I think they're, you know, bright. They have often a different point of view than mine, but one where we were often, you know, challenging each other and, and I think developed respect for the kind of the different backgrounds and perspectives that we each brought to the table. Jen had a sales and marketing background and I had kind of finance consulting background. It was a nice compliment. Um, and then that kind of relationship naturally transitioned to talking and thinking about careers. Uh, and so during our second year, when we were having kind of one of our lunch conversations around you know, career steps and, and the jobs we were planning to accept and, and those paths, um, Jen was kind of telling me a more funny story just about her younger sister, Becky. And while she was home over Thanksgiving break with Becky, um, Becky had bought a $2,000 Marquesa dress, a very fancy designer, um, and it was a gorgeous dress. But as an older sister, Jen had said to her, like, this is nuts like you're in credit card debt you're eating pizza for dinner because you can't afford to kind of you know have normal meals and she was recently that she was recently out of college so she was kind of at this lowest income earning potential in her in her career in her life um but yet had a lot of social events that she was going to and so she had said you know older sister jen like all the dresses that i have in my closet of which there were many are dead to me because they were posted in social media and she felt like she couldn't possibly repeat them um which was funny, but also like true at the moment, you know, I think social media has kind of gone even further, uh, you know, through the roof, but uh, it was really taking off this idea that you would post a photo after an event, you would solidify a memory, you'd get the more and more kind of compliments. And so it was a form of even experiential marketing and then this need to constantly wear new items. Um, and the other thing Becky had said was, I might meet my future husband at this wedding that I'm going to wear the dress to. Um, because you're in these kind of this moment in your 20s where you are going to a lot of events and it's high stakes. Like you might meet, you want to put your best self out there. You're building your own kind of personal brand. Um, and social media kind of then made it this indelible brand that you're building. And so there was kind of a rationale and this kind of disconnect in the market. And when we started thinking about the designer industry and what had happened in that, that moment to respond to it, there was a lot of fast fashion brands, so Zara, H&M, Forever 21, that were coming in to try to address that gap and that, that consumer frustration and problem. Um, but designers were, were left kind of scrambling and, and were really open-minded um, in a different way, it, though it was a small open-mindedness um, that took a while to trying out a concept like Run the Runway. Um, and so that's how it began. And the initial vision for Rent the Runway, you know, obviously it's, it's ended up being a huge, huge business. Did you set out to build a business which would dominate the sector and be very large? Or was this more an organic thing that, you know, you thought it was a great idea, let's build it and let's see what So I think, you know, Jen would say, and this is part of why I think we're like, great, you know, we made great co-founders, um, but she was always going after this huge visit, vision of democratizing luxury, changing an industry. Um, I, you know, my skill set is like, how do you get from point A to point B? So to break down a big ambitious vision, um, you know, we definitely didn't know exactly where it would be kind of the 10 years later where we are right now. Um, so even though we had visions for how could we do 100 million in revenue, how could we, you know, how could we grow the dress rental portion of the business, which is where we started. I don't think like we could have even imagined how much that business would have evolved and how much our customer base would evolve and certain things we would do around, you know, drop boxes to return your rental or the subscription business where now you kind of have rotating apparel of every different kind. Um, I very much was thinking about like one foot in front of the next, like drinking from a fire hose of like, what do we need to do tomorrow? What do we need to do next week to, to just keep going? And so it was like just one foot in front of the next, like chasing demand for what felt like the first, you know, four years at least before we could then kind of get our wits together and say like, okay, like infrastructure, stable enough, where do we want to go in the future? So how, tell us about the first 10 dresses, like what actually was happening behind the scenes? Because I imagine you were faking it until you made it. What did, yeah, many, well, the first 10 dresses were borrowed from friends and bought with our own kind of money. Um, and we bought them in our own sizes. So like worst case, we would have great dresses uh, in our wardrobe. Um, we, we did a trial, a test. So we were at Harvard Business School still, you know, having no venture money raised at that point and trying to learn like will customers rent dresses. And there were so many questions of like, is there a stigma around it? How much will they pay? What designs and styles will they want to rent? Um, 
And so uh, we, we bought dresses, we borrowed dresses, and we set up shop at Harvard undergrad across the way because all these students were having graduation events at the time. So a lot of reasons to rent dresses. Um, and you know, the first thing that happened is a girl walked in, she picked out the most kind of flamboyant dress, gold sequin dress, twirled around in the mirror, and she said, I look hot. And her whole persona was transformed, right? She had like an extra bounce in her step, an extra set of confidence. She didn't want to take the dress off for like the full hour. She was strutting her stuff in front of her friends. Um, and we're like, that's our business, right? It's about that, that confidence, like the why of like, why does designer fashion matter? Why does luxury matter? It is about the feeling that like, hey, I can take on this day. I can take on that date night or that event or that power meeting at work, whatever it is, and feel just great about it. And so we, we decided we wanted to build a business around that feeling. And so more of a service company, if you will, um, that was around this aspirational, this access to like this aspirational, empowering feeling. Um, so those were our first 10 dresses. It was kind of this very scrappy approach. And from those first 10 dresses, when did it then feel like you'd hit some kind of velocity, something had changed and it had, it had started to really take off? And, and how did you get to that point? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think there's a couple moments like getting a, a venture capital term sheet, I think for me coming from the world of finance and also feeling like, hey, as first time entrepreneurs, having, you know, we raised from Bain Capital Ventures, so having like a credible name, you know, connected to us, having real funding behind us that meant we could buy sizable amounts of inventory, right? Then starting to write the checks for those inventory. Um, that was definitely one moment, right? Of like, hey, we have the capital funding, the resources, the partnership with the top tier fund to be real. And so we had other jobs, Jen and I had had other jobs lined up. We at that point kind of quit those other jobs. We're like, this is gonna be real. So that was one moment. And then I think the next was definitely um, once we launched the site and, you know, day one, even when we were kind of quasi stealth mode, there's like the wait list because we were acquiring names for that first week before we formally launched was growing and growing and the appetite was really, um, really exciting. And then, of course, at launch, like just the amount of orders that were flooding in um, and then lots of little moments along the way, you know, people reaching out to us wanting and being open to intern for us for like cheap or nothing, right? Because they were so passionate and believed in what we were doing and believed in Jen and I and our vision and, and the need for this service. Um, and just the commitment and dedication that that whole early team brought to the company, I think, uh, started to kind of give us more and more reaffirmation. It's really interesting you talk about that and the buzz of the launch. And for me, when I think about Rent the Runway, the single biggest thing that jumps out is the strength of the brand and the very unusual fact that you rarely did any marketing until very recently there's very little paid marketing and so unusual particularly now you know my investor hat on you see so many startups particularly consumer startups who are addicted to paid marketing from the beginning very high customer acquisition costs you just never really face that as a business because of the strength of the brand also the product so you know one of my big heroes is edwin lamb the uh, inventor of polaroid cameras and he, his big thing which was the jobs was that marketing is what you do when your product is no good and it seems like mm -hmm. runway is like the ultimate example of that, where you just didn't have to market. I like that. Was, I like it, that. Was, it, was it more about the, was it about the product just being so good and it not existing anywhere else that it just got women talking about it? Or was it also this really well thought out brand? How much of it was product and how much of it was brand? Um, hard to separate the two. You know, I think timing was a piece of it, right? Like I think we hit a moment in time where we saw other industries like the car rental business, where at the time you had Zipcar, right? Or the movie rental business were, you know, Netflix, right? So like we saw other industries that were being transformed and this like sharing economy told us that there was more open-mindedness from consumers to accept and embrace this change. I think the other thing that happened is because of this realization around the feeling, that aspirational empowered feeling, that we wanted to rent to consumers, that being our business, um, we were very thoughtful and intentional around all aspects of our brand and our marketing. Um, realizing that whatever we put out there had to feel magical, aspirational, luxury designer, right? If we wanted you to get that empowered feeling. So we were really thoughtful about that. It also mattered a lot for our designer partners because at this moment, when we launched, we launched in November, 2009, many of these brands that were what we work with were very nervous about rental. They were also nervous about putting their product online. 
And then when they do put them online, like it's harder, they felt it was harder to control than a retail store. Like what products are you alongside and next to, right? Like how can they control this equity they felt was really important. So by virtue of having to service and get those brands comfortable, we also had to build a very aspirational, thoughtful brand. Um, what we did know is that the natural conversation starter between women at almost any event, a day in the office or a wedding, a party, is you look great. Like, what are you wearing, you know, and, and complimenting. It's a, it's a great kind of uh, social lubricant. And we said, like, can we own that moment, right? Because that would be the most powerful thing, the cheapest form of marketing, the most authentic thing. And given that rental is such a new behavior or was such a new behavior, we knew customers would have a lot of questions around, you know, what if I spill a glass of wine or do I put it in the mailbox? How do I return it? Does it come on time? What if it doesn't fit? We're like, how could we ever answer that in an initial marketing app? And I think today it's a much more commonplace practice that we, we do use marketing ads more, but initially we're like, we need to be able to enter a conversation so that a person who's tried it can actually respond to all of those questions. So that's kind of what made intuitive sense to us. Um, and we went so far as to, you know, I remember we pulled the initial kind of branding work that we were like a month from going live with because I was like, this does not feel aspirational. It was, I called it kind of Roxy Quicksilver looking, you know, pinks and oranges. And it was like, and some of that was a gut feel. Um, I often really do think that the best businesses are made when the consumer uh, is the founder, right? So like Jen and I starting the business, we were women in our twenties when we evolved the business to subscription and more types of apparel. We were in our thirties because we needed that. So I think we were very able to relate to what felt aspirational to us as consumers, what felt like something we would want to talk about to consumers. Um, I think the other thing we, we tapped into from a psychological moment in time was because I think of the recession and businesses like guilt group, it was starting to become cool to save money and be smart about shopping. Um, so suddenly something like Guild Group, which was like discount online shopping and sample sales was weightless and premium and luxury, which was never the case before. Like growing up, if I shopped at Lowman's and TJ Maxx, like you didn't talk about it. You were kind of embarrassed going into or out of the store. Um, today it's like secondhand is vintage and getting something on set, you know, it's like who pays retail? Like that's uncool. So we're like, okay, there's a moment of time that we can actually tap in and harness, harness here for like what a smart consumer is that will make them more likely to want to shout from the rooftops the fact that they rent it or at least kind of share it with their close group of friends. Interesting. Well, we, I definitely want to come on in a bit and talk about founding a business in a recession and, and building it from there. And yes. Talking about, you know, the other groups around then like Guild Group and, you know, Kevin, Kevin Ryan was on the series earlier on in the month, I think. So it had some fascinating things to say. Oh, great. At that time as well. Um, so what, what, just briefly then, before we move on to that pivot to subscription, what about PR and media? How, how important was that, your mastery of that, to again, just to avoid paid marketing and to build a buzz yeah. without spending any dollars? Very important. Um, and I'm glad you brought it up because I, I meant to also mention, you know, we realized that another way to have that conversation, that like longer marketing um, would be through PR, right? So you can, you know, do it intentionally with PR or you can build that brand and kind of try to insert yourself into these organic, authentic conversations. And we, and we did both things. Um, you know, I think what really hit hard with us, um, we always thought, you know, PR will be really important. We leaned into it as much as we could, but we were featured in the front page of the technology section of the New York Times um, on our launch day. Um, and that happened because, um, you know, I, I think a, a founder is like obsesses over customer lists. We were looking through customer email lists from our wait list and realized that someone was from the New York Times on that list. Um, and so, you know, reached out to kind of, you know, say, hey, we'd love to share more about the business um, and wound up, you know, convincing them, oh, do you want to include some photos? We're happy to have you into our warehouse, which is a dry cleaner. And, you know, we had these pictures of us wearing kind of outlandish dresses on top of ladders inside of a dry cleaner, which for the technology writer and the technology section who, you know, that technology writer at the time was also kind of just making her way like us, a young woman in her twenties, like wanting kind of those breakout stories was a really great fit. And that, that was another moment having that article that I think really we saw the direct impact we felt that had to our sales and the kind of awareness and the excitement from the investor community around what we were doing. And from that moment, we leaned into press in a really big way. As an angel investor, do you recommend your portfolio company founders to hire um, agencies or do you think they should just get on with it and build relationships with journalists themselves directly? 
Um, ideally both, right? And so I think it's always about resources, right? I think if you have enough resources, it, I believe that PR agencies are a good investment, you know, kind of bang for your buck marketing wise. Um, I advise them to always like speak to quite a few um, because in like worst case, you build a relationship for future or you get a lot of good ideas from the ones you don't pick. Um, I do think you need to have, you know, any agency or B2B software that you you buy whatever it is, is only as good as the people you have managing it, right? So I think if you don't have someone in-house who either has some of that background or responsibility and is constantly kind of like hounding and checking in on the agency, um, I just don't think you get as much out of it. So I think it's about the kind of follow-up, the follow-through, mixing the internal with anything you have external. Um, but with early stage lean teams, I think it's very rare to have be able to have like your own dedicated PR. So I think it's, it is a healthy kind of compliment to have an agency. Yeah, I would agree. And it's often, I think something PR is something that early stage technology companies particularly think of as an afterthought and it doesn't come naturally to a lot of tech founders. So definitely something that people can gain an edge at if they, if they nail it. Like yeah. That. I think it's really powerful. And, you know, I think there's that art that New York times article, I think also very quickly showed us that like, you know, there's two types of, press probably even there's far more than that but there's at least the element of like what is your product right and the like kind of consumer facing like hey this is rent the runway and then there's also the business element of like two female founders right out of business school no fashion background no tech background um, and I think both the moment of time we were in where entrepreneurship especially in New York was just exploding where there was a real drive to get more female um, entrepreneurs in place uh, where there hadn't been a ton of fashion and, you know, female oriented startups prior to that, that was a really exciting, resonating story too. So I think we both had a product that was really interesting and fascinating to think about that was accessible to think about. We had a story that was accessible to think about. Um, so I, I think we found very quickly that, and I, I say this to other startups too, like that business story in addition to our product itself was very powerful and engaging. So to take it from that glossy side of the business to the hardcore, detailed, yeah. difficult side of the business, am I, is it right what I said at the beginning that Rent the Runway is the largest strike cleaner in the world? Yes. To my knowledge, that is still the case. And how the hell did you do that? I mean, that sounds yeah. like really bonkers to build up. Um, that was wild. So that was a lot of, of, my, of my time and work at the business. Um, and I never would have, right, however much I wouldn't have expected working in fashion or technology, I also wouldn't have expected for sure, working in dry cleaning. Um, I mean, it started out that we, we needed to get dresses cleaned. So when we were initially in Boston, we went to the local dry cleaners there and we tried to negotiate bulk rates for these tests that we were doing. Um, but then once we were very quickly back in New York and that's where we wanted to set up the business, I was go to my local dry cleaner around the corner and say, you know, what do you normally charge me 15, $18 for cleaning a dress? What's your cost? Okay, if your cost is $5, can, you know, can we pay you six? Can we pay you seven, eight, you know, and, and figure out kind of a pricing. Um, and so that's how it started. Uh, I, I noticed he had an empty rack in his dry cleaning facility. I was like, can we keep our dresses here? So pretty soon we had free storage. Um, but it also let him feel more comfortable that we were committing to kind of the volume that we were going to do. Um, and then by virtue of just that's what our warehouse was. And I was there for half the day. Um, started learning a ton about dry cleaning or naturally by being there, by needing to troubleshoot and problem solve when a dress was stained or, or this or that. Um, and in part of kind of like trying to learn about uh, more effective ways to clean and to kind of scale this part of our business, uh, I was able to meet the COO of one of the, like the best largest dry cleaners in New York uh, and kind of tour their facility. Uh, and that was someone who I later convinced to come work for us. Uh, and when I met him, I said, you know, one day I'm going to convince, you know, you to come work for us and I'm going to hire you. And at that time, it was kind of a joke because we, we, I don't think we'd even necessarily launched our business yet. Um, but it, it happened. And I think in the meantime, you know, he became a mentor and advisor of mine, um, helped me kind of understand a lot of the inner workings of, of the dry cleaning world. And then ultimately, we hired him to, to set up our own facility because once we grew out of, you know, one facility, it was very inconvenient to have five different places where we were sending all of our, um, 
inventory to, uh, we needed to turn them around that same day to get them out to the next customer because that's where all of our cash and capital was tied up in the inventory spend. So the turnaround was really quick. And so we very quickly realized, you know, we, we needed to have dry cleaning co-located. Um, and, you know, I think where we've taken that part of the business, we now have evolved so much IP around different cleaning methods that are less that are faster, that require less wear and tear on the dresses, that are more sustainable, have less chemicals, um, and what fabrics work in the cleaning processes. We have a whole training program for certain um, dry cleaning functions that skill set is just fairly rare or difficult. We have a whole repair team, seamstress team, where we do things like take floor length dresses and recut them into short dresses once enough of them become kind of you know, deteriorated on the bottoms. Um, so I think we've really just driven a whole level of innovation. It's, it's a dry cleaning plus plus sort of facility now. Amazing. It's an extraordinary business with the brand and the logistics going at the same time. We're going to come in in about 10 minutes or so to some questions. There's some serious big hitters from all the fashion on the line. We've got, uh, we've got the wonderful Carmen Busquets and Alain Massonet from Net-A-Porter fame. Um, we have got, uh, I think, Pierre Lagrange there as well. So some really interesting people will, will come to people to questions in a moment. But let's just finish off the, the Rent the Runway journey before we do that. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that pivot, well, not pivot, but that evolution into subscription, um, which I imagine was really important from a financing point, point of view and eventually as you think about IPO or some kind of liquidity event. Um, was that scary to, to think, right, we're going to have to rebuild the business almost from scratch. The, the concept's going to change. Maybe the price point, the demographic might change. Was that a scary thing to do? It was very scary. Um, I think we, uh, we had learned some hard lessons, though, early on around being really careful with inventory selection. Um, and so I think we were, we were very thoughtful. We took our time in approaching it and did a lot of testing, um, just the way an early stage startup do does um, before we kind of launched into it. So as much as it was scary, it was very well calculated risk that we were, um, we felt we could be patient with because we knew how hard the nuts and bolts of our business was. So this whole time, you know, we don't have many competitors and it's because it's a really hard business to run and it's a very hard business to scale. So it let us, I think, have that freedom and latitude to start things and, and to grow in a smart way, to grow in a thoughtful way, to approach every business evolution in a way that really like test, learned, iterated. So with, you know, with subscription, you know, I think largely somewhat started out of just the serial entrepreneur mind that I have, um, where I, you know, after leading logistics for the business, I then went to lead business development. Um, which was kind of like, where are we going next, right? And so we launched retail out of that business. And we did that through like a test and learn uh, situation where we had physical stores inside of our office, right? And then eventually started testing out what formats could work. Do we partner with department stores? Do we have our own standalone? Um, eventually Dropbox has emerged from that line too. And then subscription, you know, I think this kind of curiosity of how could we take some of our super users who are starting to use us like 20 times a year and how could we grow you know we saw how profitable that behavior was and once you convince someone to try rental that's kind of the hardest thing and then they become hooked like what else could we do with that core consumer base uh was was very uh was a smart way to grow from the, the kind of cost of customer acquisition perspective, but it was also really interesting from the back end logistics perspective, because initially we had people renting dresses for weekend events, right? Most people have events on the weekends. And so someone would rent a dress to arrive on a Friday, Thursday or Friday, they put it back in the mailbox on Monday because there's not mail on Sunday. We get it back Tuesday or Wednesday. We had to turn around and clean basically all of our inventory Tuesday and Wednesday to get it out the door again on Thursday for Friday delivery. So it starts to put a real strain on just kind of that labor peak utilization, that in machinery utilization, right, of, of all your dry cleaning equipment, which isn't great from kind of the back end economics for the business. So we needed to find ways to also just like smooth out on the back end some of that inventory lumpiness and kind of the operational lumpiness of the business. So subscription also uh, satisfied that. We tested everything from a jewelry accessory subscription, which felt a lot you know, cheaper to ship to and from, uh, no sizing issues, the margins were really good, um, and then started just testing different types of inventory. And so it took us, I'd say, a couple of years before we really felt confident enough um, that we had the right inventory mix, the right pricing to turn the switch on for um, what subscription would look like. You know, one other thing we did in that time period was we did a lot of 
pricing testing with our core business. So we said, okay, current customers, um, those who haven't rented, why haven't you rented? One of the biggest things was they felt they didn't have an event. And we're like, well, have you had any birthdays, baby showers, interviews, like any of these? Have you had a date with your significant other? And they were like, oh, yeah. And they were like, okay, well, why not rent for that? And what it came down to was price. Well, it wasn't an event that it was worth paying $100 for an outfit just for that. Or the thought process, you know, maybe was, was too complicated to merit that. And so we're like, well, what if it was $40? What if it was $50? Um, and so we started to realize that if we played with some pricing, then you could get a larger share of events that people felt open to putting the effort and the cost into a rental for. Um, and so that was also a great kind of helpful consumer like mentality gateway that gave us the confidence to push into subscription. And I think it's really, you know, I will say it has grown and taken over to an extent that we could have never even imagined. Just the way it plays into people's lives, the community that's formed around it, the conversations that people have, you know, desk side, the Slack channels that people have at work around like, what are you wearing and renting? And, you know, can you try meet at this hour to try it on in the bathroom so we can see what you think? Um, I think it's just been so authentic and amplified what we want to be um, as a brand to our, our community. Brilliant. And the last one on Rent the Runway then, picking up on what you've just said, what's the future? I know that you're, I think you're still a board member. Um, obviously, it's yeah. your you're a co-founder. What is the future? And are we looking at, you know, the, 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 uh, the Amazon rental business or what, what's, what's the vision? Yeah, so it's obviously a really interesting moment. Like we started Rent the Runway in a recession. And I think so many innovative, interesting ideas come out of recessions, consumer thinking changes, uh, the opportunity cost of other jobs that pay less or less interesting is lower. So people kind of go to entrepreneurial roles. But this is a different kind of recession, right? And this is one that's actually challenging the fundamental nature of like, do you need to get dressed every day? And if you do, does it matter what you wear or do you need to change over your outfits? And when people are, you know, Instagramming and putting social media posts, it's less often of them in a fancy dress at an event versus outdoor nature or their kids or a pet, you know, whatever the case or the food that they cook that night. Um, so it's a very strange, unexpected twist to kind of our world and our value proposition. That's, I think, forced a lot of creative thinking in terms of like, what do we mean? What does our brand mean to our consumers? And like, what are other things we can do to empower and embrace this strong community and business that we've built. So a lot of creative thinking to come. And I do think kind of leaning into that like community aspect um, is something that we think a lot about. Um, but I also believe that, you know, and, and what we think about is like, how do we make ourselves as strong as possible so that coming out of this moment when people are excited to go to events and dress up and, you know, it feels so good to do that. I think we have this huge kind of lift off potential. And so how do we get, how do we kind of accommodate and address that? Um, I think especially because people are not buying as many of those fancy items right now because it's such an unpredictable thing of when can they wear them? What can they do? There's going to be a real need for that. You know, when the flips, the switches are flipped to go back to work, I think there's a real kind of like actual need for people to have that, that those products and those inventory. Um, and I think we're in a moment right now where everyone is a little bit sick of the clutter of their lives and their closets. Um, and so the element of, of rental and the sharing economy, I think is just enforced and enhanced um, in terms of like, yes, invest in some of those key pieces in a smart way, but I don't need like, you know, all the dresses I do own, which are few now, but like they've been sitting there. Like, like why do I have these there? It's not a use of my space, my life, the time it takes to kind of consider what I'm wearing every day is just a, a silly waste of, a, a waste of time. Um, and how rental can simplify your life, I think, uh, is really an, an exciting opportunity that we're at the forefront of taking advantage of when we come out of all of this. So we're kind of preparing and revving up for that. It's really clear there from what you said that you obviously think very deeply about the future of fashion and the future of consumerism. You've, you've innovated with Rent the Runway from scratch. You've also innovated from within one of the largest businesses in the world, Walmart, as co-founder and CEO of Jet Black. What did you learn from that experience about how corporates can actually have an advantage in certain things when they try and innovate and then also how they struggle because of their size and scale? 
Yeah, it was super fascinating experience. So um, I built and ran the first business in Walmart's technology incubator. Um, and the idea was that in addition to growing their core business day to day and thinking about how to evolve their e-commerce site, which they're doing a great job with, um, what would they think about for five years down the road, 10 years down the road to start to kind of learn and understand different technologies to best position themselves for some of the trends that, um, that were, were down the pipeline. And, and one of those areas is conversational commerce. So the idea of shopping with a voice type of interaction, right? And so whether you think of Alexa and Google Home as, as one example, um, and the area that we started um, our work and testing on with Jet Black was around text message, so shopping over text message. Uh, and I think the many learnings that you have with that modality um, were very powerful for Walmart because with a blank field of text message or voice, you can get the raw kind of unfiltered consumer interest demand, the questions that they have. And so the learnings are much more equivalent to what you would experience in a store with a store clerk helping you versus what you try to interpret from data on a website. So there's a lot of information and data that we were able to kind of collect and gather and a lot of technology that we're able to build that I think will help Walmart pioneer and, and kind of blaze a, a unique path um, that leverages their advantages into the future of conversational commerce. Um, so I feel super proud about that. You know, I think the, the tricky subtlety is how much do you leverage the infrastructure of these big businesses, um, which can let you get off the ground much more quickly, things like finance, legal, HR, um, but can also have impacts to the culture or certain decisions that you make down the pipeline that you didn't anticipate, a, a review process, a promotional process, a bonus process if you're using certain you know, HR systems and if you're tied in certain ways, um, financial systems and budgeting processes, you know, great if you can use those systems, but do you then become accountable to the kind of larger organizations, annual budgeting processes and how that works. Um, so I think it's, you know, like all good entrepreneurial endeavors, um, a work in process. And now we turn to the Q&A. Let's go to Arno Massimo next. Arno, uh, of course, co-founder of Netaporte and very successful investor. Arno, you should come. Hi, Jenny, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Uh, hi. First of all, like, yeah, like really congratulations, huge fan of what you created. It's really Thank brilliant. Thank you. It's a game changer for sure. Uh, I guess when you created it, um, the main uh, business driver was um, towards women who couldn't really afford to buy a, a dress and actually it was cheaper to rent it and, and return it back. Um, now the question is regarding sustainability and um, there's a great opportunity uh, um, to put pressure on fashion designers who should create collections who could you only rent because then you will force uh, customers to actually that the only option is to rent. And it's not because they can't afford it, it's because that's the only way to be able to, to, to wear the latest dress from Prada or, yeah. or, or whatever designers. For, so for you, is that you as, as, as the uh, um, creator of such a brand, what kind of pressure can you put on brands to create collections specifically actually to, to rent and not to buy? That's a really great, uh, great question um, and, and great thought of kind of that, that angle. Um, I'll break it into two things. So I think, you know, first off, the sustainability component of our business. Uh, what's fascinating is like it has always been a sustainable business, right? We, we are both as thoughtful as we can be around the cleaning solutions and solvents we use for dry cleaning being as sustainable as possible, the packaging we ship in being reusable packaging, like we've done a lot in the space, but the mere concept of rental and sharing is sustainable in and of itself. Yet it's only now 10 years in, in the last year that I think we've gotten any real credit or appreciation from consumers. So I think to some extent we've been like kind of being out there like saying, hey, and it's sustainable. And now I think it's more and more often like one of the first questions or things that people want to talk about. So I think that's an exciting thing that we're, we're getting credit for that as a brand and that there's more consumers saying like, 
hey, I pick you because of this aspect. And, and I think at the end of the day, it all comes down from a kind of what, what leverage can we get with the designers? It all comes down from consumers voting with their wallets too, right? So I, I think the more it matters to consumers um, and the more we can kind of like have their, you know, testimonials and the fodder of like, that is why they are renting um, as proof points and data points, the more we can use that to work with designers. Um, we do have a bunch of designers that we co-create co capsule collections that are for rent only. Um, so I don't think we have any brands yet where um, except the couple that we've created as our private label brands um, where they only rent all of their products, but we certainly have a bunch of brands and fantastic designer names and labels where this like kind of capsule collection that we co-create is only available for rent. Um, but there's probably more that we could do to lean into that from a sustainability perspective. Let's go next to Laura Stebbing, who's the CEO of Accelerate Her, which promotes the inclusion of women in technology. Um, who I should give a quick plug to her events coming up on the 12th of June with none other than Hillary Clinton. Which yeah, great. I saw that. I, I was excited about that as well. You must come, Jenny, and ask a question. But uh, yeah. at the moment, Laura has a question for you. Go ahead, Laura, you should be unmuted. Thank you so much. And, uh, and thanks for the plug. And Jenny, really loving this talk. It's brilliant. Um, oh, good. So I, I love your point that it's really important for founders to also be the consumers of their business, as you were. Um, but we know that women who are building uh, building businesses for women often really struggle to get funding because they go to VCs who are often mostly male um, who don't understand the kind of business they're trying to build. I mean, we know, for example, Heidi Zach from Third Love, who said she was pitching all over it and talking to people who were experts in cyber and crypto, but she completely lost them when she used the word bra. And um, what, what would you, how did you find the fundraising process, you know, when you're building a, a consumer business for women? And, um, and what advice would you have for, for women in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. It's a topic I'm very passionate about. Um, luckily, I have seen improvements in the past 10 years. We have a lot more ground to cover. Um, so personally for us, you know, the early, early stages, because that is, um, you know, raising our seed round, somewhat our A, but like mostly our seed round, where you don't have much of anything to show for it. You're really like, you know, two young women with an idea going out there. That's when I think most of the biases really came out. Um, and so everything from people treating us like, oh, that's nice, that's cute, like two girls working on a fashion idea. Um, let me like, you know, ask my secretary what they think of this, or they pull in my daughter and, you know, stuff that felt a little pedantic and like not that we were, you know, running a serious business or, you know, taking us as seriously that just didn't felt feel good, right? And I think for us, like we had the privilege of kind of like voting um, with where we chose to take funding. Like we had enough interest that we're like, well, we don't want to work with those people, right? So I think aligning with the right partners that understood us, respected us, you know, the partner we took money from being Capital Ventures, who's invested with us every round since, um, even though it was a male partner, Scott Friend, who's just fantastic and like deserves the title co-founder alongside us, he came to those pop-up tests. So we invited a bunch of, of, you know, VCs. We're like, hey, we're doing these trials. Like, come if you want. Like, he came. He saw. He watched. So he's like, no, like, I am not a woman that can understand the actual emotional value, but I can see that girl twirl around in the gold dress. I can talk to them. I can ask them questions. Um, and actually, you know, for the, those who didn't come, though, to the, the pop-ups, we took videos. So another thing I tell all female uh, entrepreneurs and that we started doing was to show rather than tell. So starting every pitch meeting, with these videos of the girls twirling in the gold dress or the interviews of like the testimonials so that people could understand it wasn't just about the product, it was about that emotional empowering feeling of wearing designer fashion. Um, that was really helpful for us. Um, you know, I think now there's more and more of a, a network, uh, more, more female VCs for sure than there were. I personally invest in, in a lot of uh, female run founded businesses, um, you know, I think the data of women influence over 80% of e-commerce purchase decisions, um, I think purchase decisions overall, which means that we are better able to kind of step into the psyche of that consumer and create products for them, um, I think is, is getting a lot more receptivity. The ability to penetrate industries like fashion, which are thought of as these kind of, you know, more fluffy female businesses, like because we've had businesses now like Rent the Runway or Guilt Group succeed, um, Glossier, you know, like, I think there's a lot more uh, people and women out there also getting good press and, and building, you know, this roadmap for how it is possible, how it can be done. So I'm very encouraged 
by it, um, I, I, you know, I will commit kind of the rest of my career to trying to help further that in any way that I can. Let's go to Pippa, uh, who is a partner at Sweet Capital. So uh, a lot of the founders who pitched me at the moment with the kind of sustainable rental fashion businesses, I think come at it from more of a curation, from more of a fashion perspective. Uh, and I always point them towards the learnings that, that you guys had. So I guess, what is the one operational breakthrough that you guys made that really transformed the business? Was it, you know, how you did collections? Was it how you did packaging? You know, what was that one thing you'd point to that made your life a lot easier? Thanks. Um, there were a lot, or there have been a lot, but I think the biggest thing is the ability to turn items around the same day. Like that's the real secret sauce. And there's a lot of operational, you know, and dry cleaning, you know, all this stuff that, and vertical integration that enables that to happen, right? It's, it's much, there's a lot that goes into that problem, but being able to do that lets you spend less money on your inventory, right? So like keep that cost as low as you possibly can um, to get customers in the case of subscription, their product as quickly as possible. Um, but I think, you know, it, it enables the most capital efficiency that you can get in a model like this, if you can do that. Great. Thank you, Pippa. And Jenny, thank you so much. Clearly an inspiration. Yeah. Lots of thank, entrepreneurs. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate you joining my first minute. Thanks so much. And thanks for joining us, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Jenny, thanks.